Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting PBS Digital Studios. I got a physics joke for you. A proton, an electron, and an antineutrino walk into a black hole. That's it. We've established by now that black holes are weird. The result of absolute gravitational collapse of a massive body, a point of hypothetical infinite density surrounded by an event horizon. At that horizon, time is frozen and the fabric of space itself cascades inwards at the speed of light. Nothing can travel faster than light and so nothing can escape from below the event horizon. Not matter, not light, not even information. These ideas are pretty mind-blowing, but as crazy as black holes are, they're also kind of simple. Don't get me wrong, the math is complicated, but the objects themselves are simple. In fact, every black hole in the universe, no matter how it formed or what happened to it afterwards, can be perfectly described with only three properties. Those properties are mass, electric charge, and angular momentum. Or at least, this is the proposition behind the famous no-hair conjecture, or no-hair theorem. Today, we're going to see why black holes are bold. And in an upcoming episode, we'll combine the no-hair conjecture with everything we learned recently about the conservation of quantum information. The result will be the black hole information paradox, one of the greatest unanswered questions in modern physics, and also the gateway to black hole thermodynamics and the holographic principle. Jacob Bekenstein was a graduate student at Princeton when he proposed that no other properties besides mass, electric charge, and angular momentum should emerge from beneath the event horizon. Or, as Bekenstein put it, black holes have no hairs. This is why you don't let graduate students name things. Bekenstein's advisor, the legendary John Archibald Wheeler, took up the phrase, and so now we're stuck with it. The basic reason for the no hair conjecture is straightforward enough. The interior of a black hole is cut off from the external universe. It's causally disconnected. Nothing beneath the event horizon can influence the exterior universe because no signal can escape the event horizon to carry that influence. The black hole could have formed from a collapsed star or entirely out of antimatter or photons or monkeys. The only thing we can know about the material that went into the black hole are its mass energy content, electric charge and angular momentum. Given the one-way nature of the event horizon, the loss of this information makes some intuitive sense. Perhaps more mysterious are the three exceptions, the three remaining hairs around our otherwise bald black hole. After all, the forces involved, namely the gravitational and electromagnetic forces, are only communicated at the speed of light. So how does mass, electric charge and angular momentum communicate their influence across the uncrossable horizon? Let's think about this in terms of fields. And we'll start with the gravitational field. Gravity may be caused by mass, but a gravitational field is a very real thing all on its own. In Einstein's general theory of relativity, we think of the gravitational field as curvature in the fabric of space-time. In the good old rubber sheet analogy, a heavy ball stretches the sheet downwards, affecting the motion of objects moving on that sheet. We can think of the gravitational field at any point as being caused by the gravitational field at surrounding points. Each point on the rubber sheet doesn't actually see the source of the gravitational field, instead it stretches and curves in response to the behaviour of the surrounding patches. The Earth orbits the Sun, but more directly it orbits the Sun's gravitational field. You could change anything about the Sun other than its mass, and the Earth would continue in the same orbit. If the Sun were to suddenly vanish, Earth would continue to orbit the existing gravitational field for 8 minutes. The spacetime at the location of Earth's orbit would remain curved until the elastic fabric strained itself out at the speed of light. In the case of the event horizon, the outside universe can't see the mass inside the black hole, but that mass is remembered in the gravitational field, the curvature of spacetime above the event horizon. In fact, the space at the event horizon is already falling inwards. It doesn't need to be told to continue doing that, and it drags the layer directly above it, continuing the cascade, even after the central singularity is lost to all causal influence. There's an extremely important law in physics that describes how the universe remembers the contents of a region of space. It's Gauss's law, which applies to both gravitational and electric fields. 
Gauss's law of gravity states that the total gravitational field added up over any closed surface is proportional to the amount of mass and energy contained by that surface. The distribution of matter inside that surface is irrelevant. The mass could all be located at a single point within the surface, or it could be evenly distributed across that surface. The resulting summed gravitational field would be the same. In the case of a black hole, at least a non-rotating one, the event horizon is a closed spherical surface with a singularity at its centre. That surface remembers the internal mass as though it were spread evenly across the surface. Now, the original Gauss's law actually applies to the electric field. In fact, it's one of Maxwell's equations which together give the classical description of electromagnetism. Gauss's law for the electric field says that the total electric flux passing through a closed surface depends on the amount of charge interior to that surface. The universe remembers the total charge that exists in the region of space enclosed by the surface. This means that the electric field above the event horizon of a black hole remembers all of the electric charge that fell through that surface. Black holes act as though their charge is spread across the event horizon. If you've studied some introductory physics, you might remember that the gravitational and electric fields have something in common. Both obey an inverse square law. Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law for electrostatics say that the strength of the force produced by these fields drops off with the square of the distance from the source of that field. This comes from the fact that if you draw increasingly large spheres around a point-like field source, the intensity of those forces gets spread out over an increasingly large area. You can think of lines of force getting further and further apart for larger spheres. The area of that sphere is proportional to the square of its radius, so the density of the lines of force decrease with distance squared. In fact, Gauss's law is a more general form of these inverse square laws. It applies to any shaped surface surrounding any shaped mass or charge. But both Gauss's law and the inverse square law work because of a key similarity between gravity and the electric field. They are infinite in range and they arise from conserved quantities, namely mass and charge. The lines of force never fade, never vanish, and never merge into each other. They only spread further apart. That means all lines of force created within a closed region must eventually cross that region's surface. Okay, so the gravitational and electromagnetic forces have infinite range, and so Gauss's law demands that the mass and charge contents of any region of space are remembered in the gravitational and electric fields on the surface surrounding that region. Because mass and charge are fundamentally conserved quantities, the only way to change the contents of a region of space is for more mass or charge to cross its surface. In the case of the black hole, nothing can get out, but new infalling material will adjust the black hole's external gravitational and electric fields on its way in. By the way, it's worth mentioning that real black holes out there in the universe are never going to have a net electric charge. A black hole with non-zero charge will quickly attract particles with the opposite charge until positive and negative charges within the black hole balance out and the black hole becomes neutral. Okay, so we've covered gravity and the electrostatic part of electromagnetism. But what about the magnetic part of electromagnetism? And what about angular momentum? Well, you get magnetism for free. A change in the electric field produces a magnetic field, and so if the black hole is spinning or racing past you, you'll see that magnetic field. In a similar way, you can see a black hole's rotation in its gravitational field. In Einstein's general relativity, a spinning mass drags the fabric of spacetime around with it in a phenomenon known as frame dragging. The incredibly subtle frame dragging due to Earth's rotation has been detected, but it required the incredible precision and ingenuity of Gravity Probe B. The frame dragging around a rotating black hole is rather stronger. It dramatically changes the shape of the event horizon and the orbits of anything nearby. If material with angular momentum falls into a black hole, whether it's a spinning star or a whirlpool of gas, it will either add or subtract from this flow of space above the event horizon. Its angular momentum is remembered in the frame dragging, as though the entire black hole was spinning. I hope I've given you a sense of why mass, charge and angular momentum are remembered by the space outside a black hole. It's because these properties are conserved and are communicated by gravity and electromagnetism, which have infinite range. As a result, they're remembered by the fields surrounding the black hole. However, 
there are some important conserved properties that are entirely local. If matter with these properties falls into a black hole, information about those properties is lost to the outside universe. An example would be the number of particles of different types, like the balance between quarks and antiquarks, represented by baryon number. Baryon number is a conserved quantity, but there's no way to know the baryon number of a black hole. Now this doesn't sound like a big problem, so what if the universe forgets what type of particles a black hole is made of? Actually, it should care a great deal. We discussed recently why quantum mechanics demands the conservation of quantum information. It's fundamental to quantum mechanics that the universe keeps track of its quantum states, which also means the types of particles it contains. Yet, yeah, Stephen Hawking showed that black holes may break this rule, revealing a conundrum that we now call the information paradox. The solution to the information paradox is highly speculative, but it may reveal that black holes are more hairy than we thought. We will delve into all of that in an upcoming episode of Space Time. Thanks to The Great Courses Plus for supporting PBS Digital Studios. The Great Courses Plus is a digital learning service that allows you to learn about a range of topics from educators, including Ivy League professors and other experts from around the world. You can go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spacetime to get access to a library of different video lectures about science, math, history, literature, or even how to cook, play chess, or become a photographer. New subjects, lectures, and professors are added every month. You could get a free trial by clicking on the link below or going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash spacetime. In our last episode, we looked at what might be the most fundamental rule in quantum mechanics, the conservation of quantum information. You guys had a lot of questions. Let's see what you had to say. QB Slug asks a tricky one. How is probability conserved when an electron and a positron annihilate each other? In our discussion during the episode, we talked about the unitary evolution of a one particle wave function. We said that there's always a 100% chance, for example, that the particle position always has some value. So what if the particle is destroyed? Well, particle creation and annihilation is described by quantum field theory and unitary evolution and the conservation of probability and information still works there. QFT describes the evolution of quantum fields in which particles are excited states. Now, it's the evolution of the fields, not the particles, that conserves probability. In the specific case of electron-positron annihilation, information continues to exist after the event in the products of that annihilation. It's encoded in the energy, phase, polarization, etc. of the two gamma ray photons that are created. Peter Kay asks how the universe can be deterministic given the fundamental probabilistic random nature of the quantum world. Well, the key here is that that randomness arises at the level of observation. A wave function prescribes the probability of observing a given value for a property when the observation is made. But the wave function itself evolves in a unitary manner, preserving all information. Exactly what happens at the moment of observation is still debated. In the Copenhagen interpretation, the wave function collapses and unitarity is not preserved. But that's increasingly disfavored. More likely is that the observer and the observation are a small part of a global wave function that continues to evolve in a unitary manner. John asks whether the only way to truly erase a hard drive is to throw it into a black hole. Well first, John, I assume you're asking for a friend. Second, as we'll see next week, even black holes probably preserve information. Whatever terrible secrets your friend has on that hard drive most likely get radiated back out over countless of billions of years as Hawking radiation, where it can be collected and giggled at by a future super-advanced civilization.